I, am, uh, I can't tell you on a personal level how excited I am to have Dr. Brawley with us. Um, I don't know that he will remember, but um, I think every one of us, uh, particularly junior faculty, will sometimes, when we were junior faculty, has a, uh, what we call the first time I saw Dr. Brawley. This is, as you could tell, one of the reasons why the communication team wants to keep me on script. But I will tell, <laughs> I will, will tell you the, the very first time I was at University of Colorado. I, um, at the time, didn't know that I was a confused pulmonary oncologist. Didn't, couldn't tell the difference. I had training with um, folks like York Miller and Paul Bunn. Paul Bunn was, I mean, a, an amazing lung cancer oncologist. York Miller and others sort of wrote the book on pulmonary people. And so I was very confused one day when Andrew Kraft sort of said, I know you're a pulmonologist, but really we understand you're really a, a hidden oncologist under there. And so I was like, you know, really getting my career sort of started and went pathways and really interested in how my science could impact people. And so you can imagine that there was a hall full, uh, I mean a room full of people at University of Colorado at that time and I had just finished up an experiment and I heard about Dr. Brawley and I was like, you know, I, you know, I read about some of the papers that were in high impact journals and said, you know, I'm going to just go, go check him out, but I do have a serious experiment to run and, you know, I'm going to just check this in and then, you know, I'll see him for a little bit and then I will, you know, maybe leave early. I didn't leave early. The very first words out of his mouth as he took the podium was, let me tell, <laughs> I don't know if you remember this, I was like, you do know you're in Colorado. When he said these words, he goes, let me be clear that as we talk about science and you talk about race, let's really understand what we're talking about. Opening lines. After the, after the, and I was floored. I was like, oh, what? And then I started on my, phone back then you, to start looking up some of the papers and actually recognizing that for the first time I was looking at someone who really inspired me to sort of say that the connectedness between not just doing science or not just looking at disparities as really just solely race but really looking beyond that in the academics meant something. In fact there were times where I have really from afar and now on a personal level as a cancer center director, um, understanding that he was a cancer center director too, back in the days when he was in, um, you know, with the, uh, with the Georgia Cancer Center that was at Grady. You know, and understanding that there is a role for an, a, and a excellence around just simply having a rigor and discipline around knowing the academic literature. And I think that anyone who knows Dr. Brawley would know that uh, his understanding of the academic literature is outstanding. In fact, I've had papers that I thought I read until I met Dr. Brawley, and I was like, I guess I didn't read that paper, not really. <laughs> um, but what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that I think we are today blessed with being able to have someone who really does care about bringing this concept of academic excellence to its highest, but understanding its connectedness to people and humanity of that. Now, I'm gonna have to read a couple things and I know that um, because I would be remiss if I didn't really let you know who he was um, in some ways. He, again, we should all you know, be comfortable because he's coming back home to Chicago. Even though on the south side, west sides will forgive you for that. Um, he's a graduate of the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine. Um, he completed his internal medicine residency at Case Western and his fellowship at uh, National uh, Cancer Institute. Um, as I told you before, I mean, he's had a distinguished um, academic and clinical career. I mentioned earlier that he was the director of the Georgia Cancer Center at Grady Memorial. But I also wanted to let you know that, you know, where a lot of us have gotten to know him from is the work that he did um, at the American Cancer Society from 2007 to 2018. While he was there, he wrote a book about health disparities in America called How Do We Harm? A Doctor Breaks Ranks About Being Sick in America. But what other people probably wouldn't know is that this cancer center was built on one of those very first grants that we got from the ACS. The concept for us of prevention and screening and knowing that there was somebody else out there who actually cared and at the highest level at the ACS and as Kareem Watson and others would sort of attest to, that first grant actually was transformative to we, what we believe our cancer center has become in the context of the bench the community model. 
Currently, he's a Bloomberg Extinguished Professor of Ecology and Epidemiology at Johns Hopkins. He's an authority, and I do mean that, on cancer screening and prevention and leads the broad interdisciplinary research effort focused on cancer health disparities at Hopkins. Um, he's in the National Academy. I mean, there's a lot. And, and when I say he's not only a member of the National Academy, I, I think that he is exactly, when we talk about the best of the best that are in the National Academy, for me, um, particularly as a person watching and learning how to become, it was amazing to sort of see that a National Academy member carried himself, not just in sort of saying I'm a National Academy member, but being very active in that academy and being very, very active in reminding that academy, again, about the humanity of the science. With that, because he's giving me that look, <laughs> but there is a lot here, a lot more, but I'm getting the look. So I'm going to, without further ado, have Dr. Brawley uh, speak to you. And for some of the young people, I hope you had the experience like I had the very first time of sort of saying, I, now I found my calling. And so with that, I'm going to have Dr. Brawley just say uh, his presentation. Thank you. It's, uh a true privilege to be here. Um, the last time I came to the University of Illinois, it was 1982, it was to take uh, medical boards part one as a second year medical student. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Wen, let me tell you, what you have built here in a short amount of time is just incredible. And I, I love that bench to community. You know, I used to work in a world of bench to bedside, and I, I was telling him earlier, I know he stayed up all night once coming up with that bench to community thing, but it actually works. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to talk to you over the next 45 minutes or so, and we're going to get moving at a sort of fast pace, and we're going to talk about cancer control in the 21st century and look at a little bit about this whole thing about health disparities. Um, uh, these are my disclosures. I work for Johns Hopkins, and I do some stuff for the federal government, and I also have a gig with CNN. They put me on TV every once with Sanjay Gupta because it makes him look prettier, the contrast. <laughs> and as noted, I did write a book a few years ago that got on a couple of people's bestsellers list. I just disclosed that. Now, this is the first written known written mention of cancer. It's uh, found in 1862. It goes back to 1600 BC. Uh, it's a papyrus, and it basically uh, is an Egyptian hieroglyphic that notes that uh, there is no treatment for the disease, and it is fatal. But this is the earliest known written mention of cancer. And I think Dr. Wen was actually a, a co-author of this paper. <laughs> uh, cancer is a rare disease in the 18th and 19th century. It's actually incredibly rare. As a matter of fact, there's a, a, a very famous notation of a pathologist over here at Rush in the 1890s calling all the medical students down to an autopsy so they can see someone who died of this rare disease called lung cancer. Of course, it is the most common cause of cancer death today. The American Cancer Society, which until uh, eight months ago I worked for, uh, predicts that 1.8 million Americans will be diagnosed with the disease this year, and 607,000 are going to die from it. Uh, Age-adjusted mortality rates show a 26 percent decline from 1991 to the year 2016. That simply means that the average American, their risk of dying from cancer went down by a quarter. It's three quarters of what it was in 1991. That's a good thing. Uh, here you can see it. Another way of thinking of it is in 1900, and this is age adjusted to remove the aging of the population. Uh, in 1900, for every 100,000 Americans, 64 died of cancer. In 1991, for every 100,000 Americans, it was 215. And in 2016, it was 159. 215 to 159 represents a 26% decline. A lot of people relish in that 26% decline. I actually wonder why did we go from 64 to 215, and we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, as we end the talk. 
Now, as we move from a 19th century definition of what cancer is to a 21st century definition, I need to talk to you a little bit about the biopsy and biopsy genomics. This is a series of genes, some of which can be mutated in lung cancer. And this is just to tell you, you know, when I graduated from medical school in 1985, we had really two kinds of lung cancer, small cell lung cancer, and I still don't know why we called it non-small cell lung cancer. You could divide non-small cell into squamous and adeno, but it was really two kinds of lung cancer. Today, when we look at non-small cell lung cancer, we look at these genetics and we're starting to figure out that there are a whole bunch of different kinds of non-small cell lung cancer. There are in the literature now 80 different kinds of non-small cell lung cancer. Lung cancer has actually become an orphan disease if you're a drug developer. You know, I used to do a 300-person study uh, looking at Taxol in 1990. I actually was a co-author on that paper. Now, uh, though we now know that those 300 people who were in that trial probably represented 60 or 70 different kinds of lung cancer. So how we develop drugs is radically different now. Now, this is Rudolf Virchow. Uh, those of you who have medical training, nurses and doctors here will recognize Virchow's node. This is the pathologist, German pathologist in the mid-1800s. Uh, he did a lot to define what cancer is. He is indeed the person who did a series of autopsies with his students in the 1850s and in 1853 published a book describing what cancer is. He's the first person to take cancer, add autopsy, slice it thin, put it on a piece of glass, screw, uh, stain it with carmine. Later on, his friend Dr. Bayer would introduce him to H&E staining, which we still use to this day. But this is an H&E stain. And Dr. Uh, Virchow was a marvelous artist, and he drew pictures. They didn't have photography back then. He drew pictures, and he said, this is cancer. If you do a biopsy of tissue and you see this, this is cancer. This, in this case, is adenocarcinoma, okay? Doctors to this day, pathologists in the hospital across the street here today are looking at slides and saying this patient has cancer because they see something like this. Now, what happened between 1853 and 2019? number of things. X-ray was developed in the 1890s. Mammography, X-ray of the breast, became uh, a, a technology in the 1920s, really ramped up in the 1950s, and really, really ramped up in the late 1970s. Ultrasound came to us in the 60s, CT scanning in the 1970s. That's a University of Illinois invention, I believe. Uh, magnetic resonance imaging in the 1980s. Uh, things like markers like prostate-specific antigen in the 1980s, uh, and then stereotactic biopsy, the ability to stick a needle into something. Today, we can do a mammogram, then do ultrasound, and find a six millimeter lesion in a woman's breast. And with stereotactic biopsy, we can stick a needle into that lesion get a piece of it, send it to a pathologist, and that pathologist does 1865 uh, technology, mounts it on a slide and stains it with H and E, looks at it under a microscope. You know, pathology has advanced. The light of the microscope is electric now instead of a candle. And the pathologist is going to look at that slide, look at that biopsy, and say, this is cancer. This patient has cancer. Now, the difference is the patient in 2019 has a six millimeter cancer in her breast. The patient who was autopsied in 1853 had widely metastatic cancer and died. Indeed, Virchow is the first person to actually note that cancer metastasizes and spreads and kills. Okay? Now, think about it six millimeter thing that looks like this versus somebody who is dead. The assumption is this always grows, spreads, and metastasizes. And we have realized that that is wrong. We're starting to realize as we look at these genes and other things that certain cancers do not grow, spread, and metastasize. 
And this has led us to the field of overdiagnosis, the fact that we actually cure some cancers that don't need to be cured. And we're working with genes like this to try to figure out the cancers that need to be cured. We want to be able to say, Mrs. Jones, you have a cancer and it's the kind that kills and you need to be treated. Mrs. Johnson, you have a cancer, it's the kind that's not going to spread and kill and it's the kind that needs to be watched to make sure that we're correct. We want to save people from being cured of a cancer they don't need to be cured of. That's the new 21st century definition of cancer. Now, as we as epidemiologists, I'm trained as both a medical oncologist and a screening epidemiologist, as we look at the population of people who are diagnosed with cancer, we're starting to realize that 10 to 20 percent of people who have CT scanning of their lung and end up with a diagnosis of lung cancer 10 to 20 percent have those overdiagnosis cancers that don't need to be cured because they, they're just going to sit there forever being very small. It may be up to 50 percent of breast cancers. Most of us think it's about 20 percent of breast cancers. It's 80 percent of ductal carcinoma in situ of the breast. It's 40 to 60 percent of thyroid cancers, and it's over half of all prostate cancers. These are the things that don't need to be treated, and much of our scientific efforts are now geared toward being able to tell a man you should be watched versus you should be treated, uh, depending on what your can uh, cancer is. Now, treatment has harms. Diagnostics have harms. There's an emotional toll to being diagnosed with cancer. There's an emotional toll of being told you have an abnormality in the breast and over the next two weeks you need to have a series of tests. Cancer screening can be very beneficial. It can save lives. It can also be very harmful. And it's often both. And by the way, there are certain cancer screening technologies that we thought were good and then when we evaluated them in a gold standard randomized trial thought they were, found out that they were not. Lung cancer screening with chest x-ray in the 1960s actually increased the risk of death. Urine VMA screening of children, VMA is vanilla mandelic acid. I stayed up all night to come up with that. Uh, urine VMA screening is a test done in one-year-old children looking for a neuroblastoma. It was actually quite popular in Quebec and Japan for some time. Uh, ultimately, it was stopped because it was found that it actually was net harmful. It actually caused interventions that kill some kids. But there are screening tests that do diagnose cancer but are net harmful and therefore are not done. So we need to follow the good science. Now let's talk about prostate cancer. There are positive and negative trials, all with a number of biases tainting their results. And it is likely that prostate cancer screening saves some lives. It's very likely. But the harms are actually better proven than the benefits when one looks at all the clinical trials. <laughs> 11 of 11 trials have demonstrated harms. And there's actually only two clinical trials that have actually shown that prostate cancer screening saves lives. Keep in mind, all 11 trials have flaws. The one trial that everybody quotes, the big 180,000 European randomized screening trial of prostate cancer, the ERSPEC trial, can actually be interpreted this way. Everybody knows that that study shows a 20 percent decrease in relative risk of death. But let me unpeel the onion for you. This is actually data that is currently on the American Society of Clinical Oncology website. This is how they interpret the data, not how Otis Brawley interprets it, although Otis Brawley agrees with them. Of 1,000 men, age 55 to 69, who start regular screening over a 12-year period of time, 100 will be diagnosed with prostate cancer. Ten years ago, almost all 100 would be treated. Today, it's less. Four of that 100, or four of that 1,000, will die of prostate cancer by, you know, over that 12-year period of time. 1,000 men treated. 1,000 men screened, 100 men diagnosed, 4 die. Of 1,000 men who choose not to be screened, 60 will be diagnosed with prostate cancer, and 5 will die. 
100 verses 60, 5 verses 4. You see, the 5 per 1,000 dying going to 4 per 1,000, that's your 20% relative risk of death. But at what cost? 60 being diagnosed versus 100 being diagnosed. Uh, now, every one of those 96 men who are diagnosed with prostate cancer think that they're the one in 1,000 people who benefited from prostate cancer screening and treatment. Looking at the data today, uh, recommending against routine screening for prostate cancer are these organizations. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force gets a lot of criticism in the press because they recommend against routine prostate cancer screening. Most people don't realize all these other organizations uh, agree with them. Recommending for informed decision making. Not that people should get screened, but they should know the benefits and the risks and then make a decision are these organizations, including the American Cancer Society that I used to work for. The American Urological Association, uh, the docs who actually treat prostate cancer, I think give a very insightful uh, uh, statement on their website, given the uncertainty that PSA screening results in more benefit than harm, a thoughtful and broad approach is necessary or critical, and then they call for informed decision making about the fact that people may be overdetected and overtreated. The urologists do what I think is a wonderful thing for professionals who make money off of this to do. They say people should be informed. And they admit there's a possibility of benefit and a possibility of harm. Now, quality of treatment is incredibly important in outcome. Surgery, radiation, uh, people who do observation. It's important to know that you can overwhelm a healthcare system with people who have prostate cancer and actually start decreasing the quality of other procedures, other treatments done in that system. You have to keep that in mind. Lung cancer. It's estimated that um, uh, there's a lung cancer screening study we looked at spiral CT, looked at 54,000 people who got screened, 50, I'm sorry, 54,000 people randomized, 27,000 getting screened. 27,000 uh, getting uh, a sham screen uh, done every year for a while. That study showed that of the people who got the screen, 348 died from uh, lung cancer. Of the people who didn't get screened, it was 435 who died. 435 minus 348, that means screening prevented 87 deaths. People talk about the 20% decline in relative risk of death associated with lung cancer screening. Rarely do they mention table four in that New England Journal of Medicine paper. Now it's about the 16 people in the screening arm who died as a result of positive screens calling for bronchoscopies or biopsies of their lung. Yes, there's a 20% decrease in relative risk of death from lung cancer, but that translates into 87 people did not die and 16 people did die. For every 5.4 lives saved, two people ended up in an intensive care unit because of an invasive procedure and one life was lost prematurely. By the way, of the 16 people who died as a result of lung cancer screening, six of the 16 did not have lung cancer on autopsy. The NLST, the National Lung Screening Trial, this study I'm talking about, done in 30 of the finest hospitals in the United States, done in 54,000 people in 30 the finest hospitals of the United States. And here you have the rate of uh, complications. Literally, literally eight and a half to 10% of people who ended up getting a procedure had a complication. That's part of what needs to be in terms of informed consent or informed decision making when we talk about lung cancer screening. Now, 
I mentioned it was 30 of the finest hospitals in the United States that did this study. And this brings us to the epidemiologic concept of efficacy versus effectiveness. Efficacy is how well did it work when it was done in those 30 great hospitals. Effectiveness is how well will it work when it's done across the United States. And since I'm in Illinois, I am, I am passing up the opportunity to say, how is it going to go down in Peoria? No. How is it going to go down in community hospitals versus when this is done at Johns Hopkins, and Emory, and uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and MD Anderson? And this brings us to the field of health disparities. I pointed out a lot of things that can be done in medicine to hurt people, and I have spent a lot of time worried about why minority people, especially black people, have some distrust about us in medicine. I've actually gotten into trouble. You talk about Colorado. Biggest time I ever got in trouble was when I said, black people are actually right to be suspicious of some of us who wear white. We oftentimes in medicine candy coat the truth or don't tell the truth. And we actually deserve, the people who we are talking to, the people who we're sworn to take care of, actually deserve the impartial truth. Now, let's talk about health disparities and why we have some of these health disparities. And indeed, the field evolved over time. And we're going to talk about some cancer mortality trends, economics, and so forth. It came out of the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s. And the first element of special populations health or health disparities was the notation about sickle cell disease. And we still have problems in the United States realizing that's not a black disease. There are white people from Spain, Greece, Italy with sickle cell disease, very rarely known about, by the way. And people from southern Africa, Natives of Southern Africa, they never get sickle cell disease. I just described for you white people who get it and black people who don't. In the United States, through our racial lens, we think of it as a black disease. Uh, so minority health, special populations health, health disparities, health equity, it's changed over time. I actually worked for David Satcher when he first started calling it health disparities or disparities in health. And now we're going to show you some things by race, location, socioeconomic status. These are the five racial categorizations given to us by the U.S. Office of Management and Budget. Uh, the U.S. Office of Management and Budget defines race about two years before every census. Most people don't realize that. If you know anybody from India, if they came to the United States prior to 1950, they've been three different races because the U.S. government has changed their racial category three times. And my favorite of all time, Barack Obama was a white boy in 1970. He only became black in the 1980 census. The 1970 census said you should define yourself as the race that your mother considers herself to be. That was the rule. But anyway, these are the categorizations. Uh, Hispanic is the one, or non-Hispanic are the two ethnicities that are in this survey. Uh, these are socio-political categorizations. They are not biologic. They have been rejected by the anthropologic community. I oftentimes say that from a biologic or genetic perspective, if you want to categorize populations by race, that's like trying to slice soup. It doesn't work. Now, that's Biology. Now, if you want to talk about sociologically what a black person is, I can, I can tell you, you can do that. That is a categorization that I have lived personally. Uh, region of the U.S., there are disparities by that, rural, urban, neighborhood. Some of the best neighborhood stuff that I've seen has actually come from this cancer center. Dr. Wen gives a great talk about neighborhood differences in cancer. Looking at socioeconomic status, we can look at a number of things. Education is where I've focused a lot, and you're going to see that in a little bit. This is mortality by those five racial ethnic groups, okay? From 1990 to 2015, you can see blacks and blue on top, uh, whites in red, 
Native Americans with the tremendous noise going across the middle because they're only about one to one and a half percent of the entire population. And then Hispanics uh, and then Asian Pacific Islanders, we use that categorization. Uh, Asian Pacific Islanders has changed a lot over the last 20 years. Uh, again, 1.8 million diagnosed, 202,000 will be black. 607,000 deaths, 72,000 will be black. Mortality rates have declined tremendously. The black mortality rate has gone down 35%. That's simply, the blue line is going down faster than everybody else. We started higher and we're going down faster. You can see various diseases here. I want you to note in breast and colorectal cancer, there were no disparities black for white in the 1970s. It's only since about 1980 that we've had disparities. And in breast cancer on the top left there, the disparity in death rate is greater today than it's ever been. There was no disparity in black-white mortality for breast cancer until the early 1980s. Same is true for colorectal cancer uh, in men and women. I do not understand prostate cancer. I'm a prostate cancer expert, but I cannot tell you why black men have a higher death rate than white men, although I will note that the death rates are getting closer and closer. And the other thing, we talk about black-white disparities. Notice there is a white disparity with all the other racial ethnic groups as well. And by the way, the mortality rates for Hispanics Asian Pacific Islanders and Native Americans started at 1990 because that's when the government started publishing that data. Uh, also note population disparities always increase when we have a scientific breakthrough. When we started learning how to screen and treat for breast and colorectal cancer, that's when the black-white disparity occurred. I'm actually going to call for a lot of work in prevention. I want to point out there is no such thing as a disparity in smallpox. We learned how to prevent that disease, and once we started preventing it well, all the disparities went away. As we move into precision medicine, I expect there's going to be more disparities. Let's look at a couple of diseases. Breast cancer. These are the numbers for diagnosed and dying. 40% decline in death rate since the early 1990s. That's, that's amazing. A woman today, her risk of dying from breast cancer is 60% what it was for a woman of the same age in 1990. That's progress. This is, I showed you this already, this is black and white women for breast cancer and then the other three racial ethnic groups. You can see the disparity since 1980. Now I'm going to show it to you a different way. This is not black, white. This is Massachusetts versus Mississippi. Told you about the 40% decline in death rate. Well. In the blue states, Minnesota, North Dakota, and the Northeast there, the decline has been 44% to 51%. In the purple states, the decline has been 20 to 29%. Why has there been a 51% decline in death rate from, in Massachusetts, a halving of the death rate in Massachusetts, when in Mississippi it's only 20%? Louisiana is very close to 20%. We're not talking racial disparities anymore. We're talking state-by-state -state disparities. By the way, there are now seven states where the mortality differences are no longer statistically significant. Six because blacks have gone down to meet the white rates and then there's uh, West Virginia where whites and blacks don't do well at all. West Virginia doesn't have a disparity because of the high death rate for whites and blacks from breast cancer. That tells you something about our abilities to get good high quality treatment to people. Keep in mind, I was talking in prostate cancer, but it's true in breast cancer as well. As we overwhelm healthcare systems with people who don't need to be treated, we deprive people who need to be treated of access to care. Can't give a talk without talking about lung cancer. 
And you'll note the same places that don't do well for colorectal and breast cancer are the places that have some of the highest death rates, these dark red states in the south. By the way, I once gave a talk on what, col what cancer death rates would look like in the United States if the South had seceded. <laughs> One of the things that we need to think about is how can we provide adequate high quality care to include preventative services to populations that so often don't receive them. And when I talk about high quality care, I also mean prevention. This is Graham Colditz's list of the causes of cancer. He notes that about 60% of cancers can be prevented. Remember I showed you 1900 versus 1991? That 91 years, we started putting a lot of things into the population, some of which are on this, you know, and some of them are a little bit more subtle. You know, the car actually meant a lot less exercise for us. I actually, I do some international health. If you go to East Africa, the importation of Japanese cars into Ethiopia, Tanzania, Kenya over the last 20 years is decreasing the exercise there, and the advent of KFC is increasing the amount of calories there, and they're starting to develop some of the same problems we have in the United States. But anyway, a third of all cancers are due to smoking. Overweight and obesity, 20%. Diet and exercise, an additional 5% each. Uh, uh, occupation, 5%. By the way, 2% due to UV and ionizing radiation. That's primarily uh, uh, medical radiation, CT scanners, bone scans, that sort of stuff. Yeah, President's Cancer Panel did a whole big thing on how 1.5% to 2% of all of our cancers in the United States are now caused by hospital treatment or medical treatment. Tobacco is still a huge issue, and we need to focus on that. Infection, uh, hepatitis, head and neck cancers. Uh, it's interesting, 90% of girls age 15 in Rwanda have had an HPV vaccination, and we're at 30 to 40% in the United States. In certain states, and you can guess where they are, it's even less than that. Uh, we now have drugs that can prevent liver cancer by treating hepatitis C, and many of our Medicaid programs will refuse to pay for them. They refuse to pay $30,000 to prevent, hepa or to, to treat and cure, I rarely get to use that four letter word, treat and cure hepatitis C at $30,000 to $40,000, but they'll pay for the patient to be treated uh, palliatively for liver cancer. Prevention is something we need to focus on. When we talk about energy balance, which is too many calories, not enough exercise, and obesity, two-thirds of adults and a third of children are overweight or obese right now. Weight-related cancers are expected to rise dramatically. I like to focus on children for this statistic. That's my excuse. 4% uh, of kids were obese in 1970. And now it's 20%. It's gone up by a factor of five in 40 years. Prevention is something we need to focus on. This is obesity for adults in the United States versus some of my other favorite countries. We are the fattest country in the world. We've gone from 15% obese to 35% obese over about 40 years. Big problem for non-Hispanic black women their obesity rates have gone up higher than anybody else. You can see here, uh, compared to whites or to black men for that matter. Now, let's finish by talking about the cost of all of this mess. I told you we're screening too many people in ways we shouldn't be screened, and we're overwhelming healthcare systems that are just barely struggling to take care of black people now. We're oftentimes not telling people the truth. This is healthcare costs in the United States versus a number of countries from 1980 to 2010. The US is the black line that's taking off from everybody else. It's going up everywhere. It's going up worse in the United States. We spent $3.3 trillion on healthcare in 2016. Now, a trillion is a big number. A million seconds ago was by 11 days ago. A billion seconds ago was about 32 years ago, about the time George H.W. Bush became president. 
and a trillion seconds ago was 32,000 years before Christ. Trillion's a big number. 3.2 trillion dollars. The entire economy of Germany is 3.5 trillion dollars. <coughs> if American healthcare were its own country, it would be the fifth largest economy in the world. We spent more money on healthcare in the US than was spent on everything in the United Kingdom. That $3.3 trillion is about $10,000 per man, woman, and child. It's about 18 cents out of every dollar that was spent. To give you an idea, this is just from 2013. The red dot there is the United States. The y-axis is spending per person. We're at $8,500 per person in 2013. The, the x-axis is life expectancy. That line going up and down there, that's the average for Western European countries. We spend more money per man, woman, and child on health care, and we can't make the average for Western European countries for life expectancy. Our health care system, pardon my French, sucks. Warren Buffett is fond of saying cost is what you pay, value is what you get. We pay the highest cost, and we, the value that we get is awful. If we were Switzerland, we'd be spending about $12,000 a year for a health care policy for a family. In the United States, we're spending about $18,500. This is 2016. It's actually over $19,000 now. The problem is there's some who overconsume resources and some who underconsume resources, and health care could actually be better if we were to fix things. Keep in mind, overconsumption can kill people, underconsumption can kill people if we just balance things out and used evidence. Now, there are appropriate uses of all of these screening technologies. However, there's tremendous non-evidence-based use of these screening technologies. Don't leave saying, I'm against screening. I'm against non-evidence-based screening, especially when non-evidence-based screening overwhelms the system, actually ends up creating a system, <coughs> actually ends up creating a system where uh, people who need care cannot get that care. Now what we desperately need is cost containment. I had a slide in one of my slide sets from Upton Sinclair who said, um, it's hard to get a man to understand something when his understanding it interferes with his income. And that's one of the great problems with health care in the United States. Now let's talk about the true cost of health care as we sum up here. Starting out by saying 607,000 Americans will die from cancer this year. Uh, my colleagues at the American Cancer Society when I was there noted that college educated Americans have a much lower risk of death from cancer than non-college educated Americans. If you look at black men who have college education, their risk of death is actually lower than white men who don't have a college education. It is more, if you want to save black men's lives, to give them a college education is actually more effective than giving them white skin and white genetics. So if all people in the United States had a college education, how many would die? This is quantifying health disparities. 455,000 would die. That means 152,000 Americans, nearly a quarter of all cancer deaths, are due to disparities. It's not a new drug. It's not a new screening test. This is not a new prevention. This is what happens if all Americans get what we say all Americans should get. It's actually not even that, because 4 to 5 percent of college-educated people smoke cigarettes. One in four cancer deaths would go away if we simply got everybody everything that we all agree people should be getting. Again, not a new drug. Not a new screening test, not a new preventative. Now, the other thing that most people don't realize, and you know, we were having a conversation earlier and we were talking about social determinants of health 
which have become political determinants of health. You know, when you look at what states have, uh, have uh, expanded Medicaid as part of the Affordable Care Act, Actually, I could use one of those uh, slides earlier where all the dark purple is in the South to just show you the states that have not expanded the Affordable Care Act. That's a political statement. I apologize. Um, the majority of those preventable deaths, the majority of the 155 people who are disparate, they're white. You know, health disparities, when I started working for David Satcher in the 1970s, or 1990s was all about black versus white. But the majority of people who get less than optimal care, the majority of people who have the worst outcomes in the United States are white. So health disparities and health equity <coughs> have really become not a racial thing, but I, I just hope we can all get to the point that we all realize that every American needs certain things. And certain groups of people need a little bit more to get to the same place. And that's what we're trying to say here, the difference between equality and equity. Uh, this is the Johns Hopkins uh, original hospital. Uh, it's now used for administration. But uh, doctors round in the morning because this hospital, the rooms were originally under the dome. And every morning, doctors used to walk around under the dome. And that's where the word rounds comes from. And uh, I, I, I knew you would appreciate that. And, uh, but anyway, it's wonderful to be here, and I thank you for your time. Do we, do we have time? So we um, have time for a couple questions. Um, and I know there are some that I have two people sitting on their hand. So, um, questions? Um, we definitely have a couple of them. So, Kathy. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. You know, we had an opportunity to talk, and you know that I've followed your work and have great admiration. Of course, we kind of started talking about this a little bit last night, but I wanted you to sort of comment, given that we are at least a number of us, you know, health disparities researchers, you mentioned the whole concept of over-screening, yeah. right? You know, this is what we preach every day around screening. And mm -hmm. so last night we started talking about this. You mentioned the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial mm -hmm. and how there are these adverse events. But we also know that the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial had dismal participation for African Americans. And so I guess last night I started to say, my concern with the whole concept of over screening is that in essence, in the absolute, I agree. However, the message of over screening, I wonder if, there, if you've seen in the literature and in your work, if, whether the concept of over screening applies equally across race ethnicities uh, for actually, black women black and white women. And to what extent might that message be an issue compounded by the medical mistress? If we start talking about yeah. we are over-screening, now medical mistress, do we now are deterring people of color from getting the screens well, that they need? Well, I don't want to discourage or encourage people when it comes to lung cancer screening. I want to respect their right to know that this is something that can kill you. This is something that can help you. If you are in a healthcare situation, where you have good health care, uh, keep in mind the VA has published some wonderful papers on how hard it is to do good lung cancer screening. Uh, if you're in a situation where you have good access to good screening and treatment and you want to get screened, I would encourage that. But I think it's a mistake and it increases distrust of blacks and minorities, especially the health care, when we encourage them to go get screened and we send them into a system that is uh, more likely to harm them than even the systems that uh, were involved in this 30-person trial. Uh, uh, there's also the money-making aspect of it. You know, uh, there have been several hospitals that have been caught. As a matter of fact, I know about St. Mary's Hospital in Atlanta because I worked for Emory when we bought them. St. Mary's Hospital actually had a business plan on how screening people for lung cancer help make money for the hospital. 
Uh, and uh, now, I, we, they, don't, they, they didn't even keep track of how good they were at following up people for abnormalities and how good they were at biopsies and operating and how many people they hurt versus how many people they helped. The problem I have is they wanted to make money. Um, in prostate cancer screening, uh, the first study to show that prostate cancer screening saved lives was a radiation hormone study published in 1998. The first study to show that prostate cancer surgery saved lives was published in 2003. Uh, prostate cancer screening in this country really started in 1991. We started wholesale prostate cancer screening without scientific proof that treatment saved lives. And um, I'll just take a moment to tell you about two weeks after I went to the apology uh, for the Tuskegee syphilis trial at the White House, I went to a major American university. And I sat next to uh, the marketing guy as I was listening to this presentation about how great the science was. The marketing guy was all very full of himself and explained to me their business plan for prostate cancer screening. It's if they go to this mall, if they announce they're going to this mall and going to do free screening over a weekend, if they announce it six weeks early, this is how much free publicity they're going to get, and this is the bump in business they're going to get at their chest pain, the chest pain center, the bump in business they're going to get at their mammography center, all because they're offering free screening for prostate cancer at this mall over the weekend. And then he explained to me that if you screen a thousand men who volunteer at this mall over the weekend, they've been doing this for six years, you'll have a hundred and 35 men with an abnormality and you'll charge their insurance about $3,000 to figure out why they had an abnormality. And he noted to me that it's a strange thing. Only insured men volunteer to go get screened. And of the 135 with an abnormality, you're gonna hit bingo on 45. Bingo was his term. And of the 45 with prostate cancer, this is the amount of money we're going to make off of surgery. This is the amount of money we're going to make off of radiation. And this is the amount of money we're going to make off of freezing. We don't even freeze prostates anymore. He's talking to me. You know, I went to the University of Chicago. I know the questions they ask. I ask, how many lives are you going to save? He looked at me in my eyes, put his hand on my shoulder, and said, Doc, don't you know there's never been a study to show this stuff saves lives. This is all about making money. Okay, that's screening in the United States healthcare system. And that's why I have become a spokesperson for telling people what you know, what you don't know, and what you believe. And I think those of us who push people into screening are making a mistake and justifying their not being trusting of us. So, Gail, Gail Prince, uh, thank you, Otis. Um, you know, I just need to say that here at our hospital, in our catchment area where we are servicing, um, I know in the urology department that I'm a member of that about 70% of the patients are African American. So uh, the doctors have come up with an algorithm that includes risk factors, and of course, being African American is one of the known risk factors for prostate cancer. So we look at screening. In, well, I wouldn't. You also screening, do very not, good informed decision making. Yes. In fact, I've actually encouraged Peter Grand to publish what you're doing because I exactly. think it's a great example of what ought to be done. That's in exactly what screening. I was going to mention. What Peter Peter and Mike Aburn have come up with, and, and it's informed consent, it's informed decision making, excuse me, it's not broad screening, but it does take uh, the racial mixture into account, which is very important for screening at a certain, or getting PSA tested at a certain age. At our hospital, we have um, a much higher incidence of prostate cancer at a lower age and at advanced stage upon diagnosis. Mm -hmm. I was also going to say that this is one of the reasons why I think that we at URC have been really pushing the concept in where you live matters. The DNA really maybe is more than your DNA because the microbiome, all these other things. And so, again, as we're pushing the envelope, we're pushing the web, so we're saying not only race and ethnicity, but where do you live? Exactly. Right? Too bad. Right here. Hi. Uh, 
I'm Rose Marie Rogers, and I'm with the Patient Brigade. And one of the questions I have, you talk about getting screened and not over-treating, but what do you do for women who've received abnormal mammograms? And you say, sit back and wait. How do we change the mindset of women to sit back and wait? Well, uh, I don't have precision medicine a potential hope that actually helps me with that. Precision medicine in a long run is a hope. Uh, where precision medicine has already gotten us in breast cancer is Oncotype DX, for example, has been used very well to determine the women who need adjuvant therapy versus the women who do not. And uh, when I started in medical oncology and we really, really pushed this to the limits in the 1990s, we were giving chemotherapy to women who might relapse. And now we know women who are very likely to relapse, there should, therefore should get the chemotherapy, and women who are uh, unlikely to relapse. Now the importance of not giving them the chemotherapy, and is, I'm, I've been in the game long enough, I've seen this, about one to two percent of women who we give adjuvant chemotherapy for breast cancer come back to us with a leukemia because of their adjuvant chemotherapy. Yeah, there's actually a couple of, uh, there's, there's one very famous example of that who's on morning television nowadays. She got leukemia because she got adjuvant chemotherapy. Now imagine if I was able to say, you don't need that chemotherapy, so we're going to hold that back from you. Um, now, there are women who are going to have abnormal uh, mammograms and be told to watch and let's repeat it again. The other thing that I see, by the way, is women who have abnormal mammograms and every time they get a mammogram, they get a biopsy. And I know of women who drop out of mammography because every time they go, they have to get a painful biopsy. So we need to do all of those things better. One of my problems is there's this pro-mammography screening group out there who keep saying everybody ought to get a mammogram, but I don't see them saying we need to improve the mammography technology. So I'm curious about how we use data as it accumulates in real time to change how treatment can be stratified. And so the two examples that are immensely interesting are the head and neck tumors in HPV positive, younger demographics, mm -hmm. and also that in colorectal cancer where death rates have declined dramatically for those over 50 or 55, presumably from colonoscopy and screening, compared to the um, not, uh, well, probably rising death rates in those diagnosed below mm -hmm. 50. Yeah, first one, uh, or, or first let me talk about the last thing. Uh, Colon cancer, colorectal cancer death rates have been going down since 1980. That actually started before the colonoscopy boom. Uh, colonoscopy has probably added to that. I'm actually a big fan of fit testing, uh, and I noted in an earlier talk with some folks here that the science that tells us that colonoscopy saves lives, and it does, uh, is based on the science that tells us that stool blood testing saves lives. And, uh, and I, I, there's been no prospective randomized trial of colonoscopy. It's the group who did colonoscopy and get paid $1,000 to do every colonoscopy, looking at the stool blood testing data and saying 44% of people who got stool blood testing every year ended up getting a colonoscopy within 10 years. And so 44% is practically half. If you're going to do half of them, you might as well do all of them, especially since we get paid $1,000 for doing it. Uh, I, I mention it that way because there are some black, poor, inner city neighborhoods that I know of that could benefit from stool blood testing at $30 a year but cannot afford to do colonoscopy screening on everybody that needs colonoscopy screening. Uh, so I'm, I'm a fan of both. Now, what was your first question? Are you really asking about 
how quickly you can use changing no. demographics and epi epidemiological data to change how we look at the delivery of health care yeah. in cancer really is the broad question. It, 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 it takes a long time. It take, unfortunately, you can't pivot it on a dime. It's, you know, it's like an aircraft carrier. It doesn't, it's not, you're not going to be able to change dramatically. I really, really, and I hope I got this through in the talk, I think we spend too, too much time on screening and treatment and not enough time on prevention. And I think prevention of cancer in the long run, 20, 30 year run, is actually going to be far more effective at, uh, at uh, preventing deaths and decreasing disparities than is treatment and screening. Although I'm, I'm still a fan of treatment, of screening and treatment, I think that in this country we have um, overemphasized it. Uh, in, um, I spend a lot of time in, in Europe uh, where, by the way, death rates and survival rates and all these numbers are a lot better than in the United States. And I would note that uh, uh, if you have a doctor who is seeing a 60-year-old man with newly diagnosed moderate hypertension uh, and he has a medical student with him and that they're in France, that doctor may very well prescribe lisinopril 20 milligrams a day and say, come back in three weeks and let's check your blood pressure to see how it's doing. If you're in Chicago and you have a physician who has a medical student along with them and they see a 60-year-old man with moderate hypertension, they're likely to prescribe the same 20, lisinopril 20 milligrams a day. Come back in three weeks. If you ask the French or the German medical student, why was lisinopril prescribed? They will t explain to you that the lisinopril was prescribed to lower the patient's risk of stroke, cardiovascular disease, and kidney disease. The lisinopril was prescribed to prevent disease. If you ask the American medical student why was lisinopril prescribed, they're going to look at you like you're a fool and say, why well, was the treat as high blood pressure? And there you have the exact same intervention, but European doctors are in a mindset of preventing disease, whereas American doctors are in a mindset of making the diagnosis, treating, and billing. Because I can't bill unless I have a diagnosis in this country. All right. uh, even when we, even when we uh, have someone who has hypercholesterolemia and gets a statin in the United States, we are treating their high cholesterol. We're not lowering their risk of having cardiac disease. You know, we in the United States need to get into this mindset of preventing disease more. Dr. Beck? Uh, follow up on the, on the uh, Alcohol, I had not mentioned. Alcohol is a new tobacco, by the way. Uh, alcohol clearly causes a number of cancers, and we're starting to realize that. Uh, I think in the next 10 years, we're going to see organizations like the American Cancer Society make a decision as to whether they're going to take money from alcohol manufacturers the same way they refuse to take money from tobacco manufacturers. Uh, I think some of the, actually, I've heard some great stuff coming from the School of Public Health here today and interventions to try to change diet. And I'm convinced it's got to happen in young kids. I mean, we need to affect six and seven year olds, maybe even younger than that, uh, and, and, and you know, try to grow a generation of lean people. I give up on people in their 50s like me who are overweight and, and focus on the young kid. That's my excuse. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, and there are some interventions out there. Uh, you also have to worry about, uh, you know, the, our way of life has changed so dramatically. You and I are probably the only people in the room who can remember that in the 1950s, Everybody walked to the grocery store every three days or so, bought fresh fruits and vegetables, walked them home, and put them in this thing called an ice box. And every family wanted to have a car. 
By the 1970s, every family had a car. Today, every family has two cars. And those of us who've moved out to the suburbs where there are no sidewalks to walk, we drive to the grocery store on Saturday morning, and we don't fill our trunks anymore up because we have SUVs. We fill our SUVs up with all of these frozen, prefabricated, processed foods. And we bring those foods back and we put them in these beautiful refrigerator freezers. And the microwave and the fact that we don't sit down around the table and have dinner as a family, and all these things, all these ways of living are actually causing us to get fatter and causing us to have less exercise. And they're increasing our risk of cancer. We need to really look at the way that we Americans live and live an anti-cancer lifestyle. You know, it, to just focus on, you know, f five to nine servings of fruits and vegetables per day, that's not enough. You know, and, and I, I actually mistakenly thought that the uh, event planner here was an urban planner earlier. Uh, I, I just, I wish there were some urban planners here because they can give us sidewalks and give us ways of actually putting exercise back into our life. Actually, there's several wonderful CDC uh, grants right now looking at how do we put into our lifestyle an anti-cancer lifestyle. By the way, I've been focusing on anti-cancer, but if we can do this energy balance thing and the smoking thing is the root of a number of chronic diseases. Keep in mind, more people die from cardiac disease due to smoking than from cancer. And then, of course, there's also linked to diabetes, and it's linked to uh, orthopedic injury. We would decrease the number of artificial hips and knees if this were successful. We have time for the last two questions. Um, I'm going to be greedy and take two. Um, you had mentioned that you were like looking at the southern states, and you, dis you identified it as a state-level disparity, which I found interesting because the south has the highest concentration of the black population. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering why, one, you saw that as a state disparity instead of like an institutional racism or implicit bias, social, political thing. So if you could answer that. And then two, a lot of people sort of flipped on this informed consent, informed decision making. Like for vaccinations, we give out uh, an information sheet. Do you think that's something that should be given to people who are going through cancer screening? In, in certain cancer screenings in certain areas of the country, uh, that sheet already exists. Uh, Jerry Chodak, when he was active here in Chicago, wrote up a sheet on prostate cancer screening, which is still quite useful. Uh, in terms of the South, yes, there's a high proportion of blacks in the South. However, every one of those states, the big driver for health disparities in every one of those Southern states is whites and not blacks, because whites outnumber blacks and the number of disparate whites outnumbers the number of disparate blacks. It really, really, truly is an education thing. And when we start, I didn't show this data, but how I used to have to, you know, I, I used to have to go try to explain that black folks were not mutated in 1981 uh, when, when the, I, I, I literally showed the colon and breast cancer data and this lady stood up and said, Ronald Reagan became president and he mutated all the black people. Um, and I, had, I did some studies looking at blacks in unusual situations. Uh, blacks who are military officers and their spouses have essentially white cancer rates. They even have close to white prostate cancer rates. Now, military officers all have a college degree by necessity. Uh, they have all, in this, to get in this database, you have to have been in the military for at least 20 years. That means you've lived overseas on a military base with white people. Uh, if you're the spouse, some of these things have also rubbed off on you, like the height weight requirements to keep uh, the military member in rub off into the family. And as was once explained to me by a uh, social worker who brightened my life uh, to some of these aspects, if you have a black woman whose husband did 20 years in the army, she's probably lived in Germany and Korea or Japan. And when she gets to the big hospital, to, she is better able and less intimidated by the big hospital. And she is better able to find 
radiology, better able to deal with the obstinate clerk behind the desk in radiology and get the services that she needs compared to her sister who lived in southwest Atlanta for her entire 60 years. You know, that's some of the social science of how we actually get medicine and how we actually consume medicine. And when you look at the military data, uh, the wives of active duty military men who are black, or the wives of military retirees who are black, they have lost three quarters of the black-white disparity for breast cancer in the United States. And it's not all gone, but three quarters of it is gone. You know, so there's a lot, you know, it's one of the reasons why I de-emphasize the genetics of minority. And a lot of this is just access to all the same thing. Your, your presentation and the questions have really highlighted the, the enormous complexity of the issue of health disparities. Um, just taking one small piece, I was struck by your comments about the quality of surgery for colorectal cancer um, in the overwhelmed uh, uh, hospital, the overwhelmed pathologist. Some of these things uh, probably overlap with uh, the maps you showed, uh, what happens in the South versus the North, the people, the states that have not taken uh, Medicare expansion under the ACA, et cetera. So it would seem that this is a, a tractable problem that, that can be approached. Um, how, how, do, how are people getting at that? I mean, with, with well, those kind of data, one would want, not want to go to a local hospital for any kind of, uh, of, uh, di of, of diagnosis. Yeah, it's a huge problem. It has to do with medical economics, unfortunately. Um, you know, uh, Grady Hospital, which is a county hospital in Georgia where I worked, uh, we didn't get paid for a lot of the people we ended up having to take care of. And the end result was, you know, literally, the pathologist had to deal with five or six cases per day. And the pathology techs were always there at Grady. Now that pathologist who dealt with five or six cases per day at Grady, the next month rotated to Emory University Hospital where they might have one case per day. And so it's, it's actually, the, the interesting thing is it's not that the pathologists are always at these bad hospitals. In some instances, the pathologists rotate around and uh, uh, you know, the question becomes, how do you take the pressures off of these uh, pressure cooker hospitals, these hospitals that are just incredibly overwhelmed uh, and not very well reimbursed? Now, uh, there's another little curveball I just threw to you there. Uh, I happen to be a believer that uh, the hospitals in Atlanta that take private insurance, the nice private hospitals, they like having the safety net hospital there because that means they don't have to take care of those people who either can't pay or have Medicaid which pays less than Blue Cross Blue Shield. So having that safety net hospital there actually improves the quality of care in the private hospital while, you know, we have this medical apartheid where, you know, and it, it, I say medical apartheid because it ain't coach in first class. When you have coach in first class, coach gets there just behind first class. But in this instance, very frequently, these people don't get there. <laughs>